Thanks. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, <clears throat> I specialize in the education of children with autism. In my book, I expand this uh, focus to um, a broader range of children on the spectrum. Um, and in this talk, I'm going to be talking about a subset of uh, kids that are analytically, mathematically gifted. They may have no diagnosis whatsoever, um, but they share certain traits, as we will see, with kids on the autistic spectrum. Um, I call these kids STEM kids. And um, so these are kids that are good at certain fields that we're now all focused on in this country. The uh, sort of technological future of our country is seen to be, uh, seen to reside in science, technology, um, engineering, and math. Um, and the kids I'm talking about are uh, uh, kids who are, the teleprompter is a little, um, uh, are kids who are, in my book, what I call left-brainers. They are particularly uh, suited towards the kinds of analytical quantitative fields of STEM. Um, many of them are quite mathematically gifted. Um, and some of them, but only a subset, also have autistic spectrum um, or Asperger diagnoses. Um, these kids represent the future of STEM. Um, and they have these skills. Uh, there's a catch, though, and, and that is that a number of these kids um, have weak social skills. What do I mean by weak social skills? So it's most obvious for anyone familiar with autism and Asperger's syndrome that um, there are social difficulties as an essential part of this condition. Um, and so as a matter of fact, social difficulties are um, the central diagnostic uh, criteria in the official uh, manuals. Um, and the another, two other areas of weakness in this po population in particular um, that I'll come back to are communication difficulties and uh, need for structure. Um, and so in the therapies, for example, for children on the autistic spectrum, the, it's turned out that the most effective therapies there are um, for this group involve a lot of structure, a lot of direct instruction, and a lot of breaking tasks down step by step. Um, it turns out, however, that math uh, kids, the mathematically gifted kids, also have, um, as a statistical tendency, uh, to also have some social um, weaknesses. Um, this may fit certain nerd stereotypes, but there's actually been some research as well. And I think that this uh, particular abstract um, uh, summary is, is kind of telling. So what this says is that um, many mathematically gifted adolescents are characterized as being indolent, underachieving, and unsuccessful um, in spite of their high cognitive ability. And it turns out that this is often due to difficulties with social and emotional development. What about kids who are good at science? Um, well, there is some reason to believe that these kids, too, have a tendency towards social difficulties. And in particular, what's been found um, in the study is that there are uh, weaknesses in the area of empathy, uh, which is, of course, a foundation for social interaction in this population. Weak, weaker in empathy and stronger in what's called systematizing, which is what I'm calling um, analytical skills. Um, and so now let's take a look at you know, what, what kind of analytical skills we see in this population I'm talking about. Um, Strong analytical skills are, are most obvious in kids who are kind of identified primarily as being mathematically gifted um, and, and other left brainers, you know, um, by definition. And by the way, I should say when I say left brain, I'm not referring to actual neurology. I'm kind of using that term in the way that we use it in the vernacular, sort of like sunrise. We don't really mean the sun rises. But, um, and, um, but we also see strong analytical skills in the autistic spectrum population. And um, so, for example, uh, in terms of math skills, there are studies finding a disproportionate number of, of autistic spectrum kids in math. Um, anecdotally, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence about um, autistic spectrum kids in engineering and in, and in um, information technology, computer programming. And in fact, there's a study here that finds a correlation of higher concentrations of kids in IT-rich areas. Um, now STEM, going back to STEM, is all about analytical skills. Um, and uh, we've talked a lot about 21st century skills at this conference. And um, certainly, uh, you know, science, technology, engineering, all of this has really taken off um, and gone in directions that nobody has expected. Math, on the other hand, is both 
the sort of foundation remains the foundation for science, technology, and engineering. And you know, to get anywhere in those fields, um, you really need a very strong computational foundation in math, um, typically at least through calculus. And the other thing is that math really hasn't changed. I mean, the the math through calculus is what it's been for for hundreds of years. And so this is something that is a foundation, and it hasn't changed that much. Um, and so it really is foundational. So another reason I want to talk about math, and that's sort of going to be my focus in this talk, as a foundation of STEM, but also as something that has, in the last generation, undergone some tremendous changes um, in, in K-12 math, um, changes that have had big effects on these STEM kids and that will have big effects on our ability to meet our STEM goals. So a generation ago, back when we were in school, what did math look like? This may look familiar uh, to people. Um, and those of us who went to school in the 70s and 80s are going to remember excessive amounts of this kind of thing, columns and rows and just on and on. Um, it was not, if you go a little further back, it was not nearly as excessive. Success, excessive. It, there was more of a balance. Um, but the point here is that what's going on in this kind of task is that children are practicing one or two strategies repeatedly. Um, with multiple problems. So one or two strategies, multiple problems, and the idea is that you get faster and more accurate over time, and then you move on in a sort of systematic linear way onto the next topic. Um, and the, the word problems that we had back in our day, which we called word problems rather than story problems, were pretty straightforward, small number of words to the point. Now, what we see looks quite different. So here's an example from everyday math. Um, I believe this is a second grade everyday math. You see this kind of problem throughout the curriculum of everyday math. And um, this is a curriculum that's used in a lot of big cities, including Philadelphia. Um, and so what's going on here is that instead of doing a multi bunch of strategies, or a couple of strategies on a whole bunch of problems, what you're doing is you're taking a single number. Uh, so in the case of problem two, um, uh, the number, you pick a number, I guess, and you're representing that number in multiple ways. Uh, so multiple ways on one, one thing, one number. Um, this is another example. This is a uh, fourth grade investigations um, problem. Now investigations is another one of these curriculums that are a curricula that are being used today. Um, it's been adopted um, in a number of places, most recently in Lower Marion County outside of Philadelphia, one of the uh, more kind of uh, highly reputed school districts. And here what you see is, um, Basically, uh, you're, you're being asked to produce a lot of words, a lot of reflection on, on, your, on your methodologies. Um, you're not really being asked to produce any kind of numbers or do any, any calculations. Um, and then in, this is a fifth grade everyday math um, assignment. And here what I want to show is that another feature of these um, new math programs is that there's, you're working in a, in a group often. And in this case, it's with a partner. And you're applying the math to kind of a situation that you're kind of doing in a very hands-on way. So you're going up and down a chair, and you're measuring the pulse. And then you're collecting data on that. So there's a lot of emphasis of data on data and on, on sort of uh, actual ac activity-based discovery and working in groups. Um, I want to say that these three problems that I've chosen are not, th these three particular samples that I've chosen are not totally represented. I'm, I'm showing you sort of the things that, are, that exhibit changes. It's not to say that uh, reform math programs don't also have problems involving calculations, but there are fewer of them. The level of mathematical challenge is not what it once was. It's, it's a, at a lower level. And you're not practicing sort of a single strategy in a, in a systematic way, the way um, you did earlier, as much. Um, so what is this new, new math? The reason I call it new, new math is because some of us may remember what was called new math in the 1960s. Um, and so you know, everyday math, investigations, um, interactive math program, these are all specific curricula that all fit under this um, rubric. Um, and the term we use is reform math. So um, just to get a handle on how it compares with what we did, um, I'm using the term traditional math to refer both to what uh, happened you know, a generation ago or even earlier in this country, and also what actually still happens in most countries around the world. So most countries around the world, and you know, in Europe, and, and across Asia, and Russia, and so on, are using what we would have to call, at this point, traditional math programs compared to what we're doing. So compared to traditional math, 
Reform Math has more reading and writing. You can see there are a lot more words on those pages. Um, more applied math, more strategies per problem, and more working in groups. Um, where did Reform Math come from? So partly it was a reaction to that back to basics, endless rows and rows of calculations thing that some of us grew up with. Um, it originated in the sort of seminal moment was in 1989 when the um, PSSM, National Council, and NCTM standards came up. So the National Council, Council of Teachers Mathematics came up with some new standards. And these standards, among other things, emphasized some of these new things that we're seeing. So group work, real world application, explaining thought processes, and uh, doing multiple strategies. Um, and then we have the um, No Child Left Behind. And so that ended up reinforcing these new practices because states were allowed to design their own tests and they tended to tailor the, their tests to kind of what was happening, what the new stuff that was happening in math. And the other thing that happened with um, No Child Left Behind is with this high stakes testing, as anybody in education knows, when you have high stakes testing then there is a lot of downward pressure to kind of um, make the test easier so you don't have to fail people. Um, and so what you see then is, um, so this is not an actual PSSA test, but this is a sample PSSA test that was given, you know, to take home. And um, uh, this is a third grade uh, uh, PSSA, and I lifted just several of the questions from that test. And you can see that the, perhaps the level of expectation is not what it once was. Um, so uh, in the first question, you basically have to know that 1,100 is, is larger than 1,001, and the second, you need to know that an inch is smaller than a foot. And then in the third one, um, this is actually the third one here is an open-ended question. So you need to be able to not only answer the problem, which you've got, you already have your common denominator, so you're basically subtracting the numerators, but you have to be able to explain your answer or you won't get full credit. Because of that, when teachers teach the test, they now are requiring students to write out their explanations in, in words. Um, okay. So I don't want to say that all teachers teach the test, but there's certainly a lot of pressure uh, to be doing that and to be you know, requiring students to do that kind of thing. So I've talked about the features of reform math in terms of what's missing. Um, so compared to traditional math and the math that other countries are using still, we see less direct instruction by teachers, less teaching to mastery, less kind of repeating a task until you really have mastered it, um, less independent work, uh, and actually less math, you know, partly because of this downward pressure on the, on the NCLB tests um, than a generation ago, and the, so, such that some people estimate that by fifth grade, reform math kids are up to two years um, behind their traditional peers. Um, and so if that's happened by fifth grade, then the question is, well, what's going to happen after that? So in particular, um, what's happened to algebra? So I'm going to show you just a couple of um, al algebra, problems out of algebra books that, that show sort of where things are headed. Um, in this assignment here, it's really, actually this is not really even a math assignment so much as a reflection about how you feel about working in groups. So you're kind of, it's kind of setting you up for what's to come, which is going to be a lot of group work. Um, and so then, uh, kind of moving a little bit further in the same curriculum, this is from the International, uh, the Interactive Math Program, by the way. So, in this uh, assignment, um, you can see there's a lot of words. You know, it's much there's much more kind of a, it's much more of a story problem than a word problem. And uh, here you have to come up with multiple methods for solving this particular problem. So the multiple methods are, are continuing as well. Um, again, what I'm showing you is not representative of the entire curriculum. There's still algebra. There's still x and y. But what you don't see are um, some of the harder algebra problems. For example, I have yet to see in any reform algebra text um, three equations with three unknowns, you know, simultaneous, for example. Um, so uh, there are, there's sort of a uh, less of, of what we might have thought of as algebra. Um, so is there a way to opt out of this? Is there a way to kind of get that traditional education if, if, you, if you want it? Um, unfortunately, at the same time that we have adopted um, reform math, there, uh, we also are creating more and more barriers to sort of letting children uh, get ahead or, or learn math in, in, in a different way. Um, so um, outside the regular classroom, uh, there has been an um, elimination of, of gifted programming around the country. Um, a lot of this has to do with budget cuts or pressures to uh, uh, narrow the achievement gap. 
Um, and there's also been a, a sort of more of a philosophical um, uh, reluctance to accelerate children. There's an idea that maybe they socially, emotionally, they can't handle it. Um, and then inside the regular classroom, there's been less and less of a uh, idea of, of letting kids work on their own um, and more and more requiring uh, children to um, work in groups. And the kinds of groups that kids are working on are not based so much on readiness for the task at hand, but heterogeneously, um, uh, heterogeneous ability groups. And the idea is that the brighter kids or the faster kids in the group are going to also learn because they're going to be teaching essentially the material to um, the kids who are um, slower. Um, and so that's sort of the model. And so if you're a kid who, who like could get ahead in math, um, you know, you're not necessarily doing that. And also, um, at the same time, there's been a, a redefinition of math enrichment. So math enrichment once might have meant that you get to do alternative math. Um, but now, instead, it's supplemental. So you have to still do what everybody else in the classroom is doing. And once you're done with that, then you uh, could do a math project. But that even that is not necessarily going to be ahead. Now, I don't want to generalize and say all classrooms are this way. But there's a tendency now to kind of changing math enrichment in, in these various ways. Um, so what kind of effect does this have on our, our STEM kids? And just to remind you, these are the kids who are uh, good at math, uh, weak in social skills. Um, and so the problem is that uh, and these are kids who like to work independently and who are good at math. Um, let's look in particular at the autistic spectrum kids. Um, this is, I think, really a, a concern. So working in groups with minimal guidance from teachers and textbooks and being required to work in groups and to kind of metacognitively reflect and explain answers pretty much taps into all the greatest weaknesses of the autistic spectrum. Um, and the result of this is that the talents of these kids um, often go underappreciated. People don't even realize they're good at math. Um, and they're not being fully included in, despite our sort of philosophical mission to include these children in our society and despite the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, and now, I don't know, anyone familiar with autism has, autism has probably heard that we now have a new criteria, a new uh, manual of um, statistical disease, uh, DSM-5 coming out that has narrowed the de definition of autism. And so there'll be a number of kids who will lose that diagnosis and will lose that ability to kind of have um, IEPs that sort of mandate um, certain things to happen. So that's another concern. Um, gifted kids. Uh, there's also been some concern now about what's happening to ki gifted kids in general, and then by extension, kids who are gifted in math. Um, so there was a study that came out of the Fordham Institute recently called Do High Flyers Maintain Their, Maintain Their Altitude? And in fact, finds that we're leaving a lot of these kids behind um, uh, because we've been so concerned about achievement gap and, and NCLB. Um, and these kids are, are kind of flying, flying by the wayside. Um, Long-term effects. So uh, what happens to these kids who maybe are naturally really good at math, but because they're going through reform math programs are not getting the math education that they once did and are, are you know, several years behind their peers? We'd like to think that a mathematically gifted kid is just going to be OK. Like these, these kids are just, they'll figure out a way. They'll, they'll get ahead of math. But in fact, um, what we're hearing at the college level from you know, actual people reporting on this is the picture isn't so, so good. Um, so this is someone I quote in my book who is a re recent MIT grad. And what she says is that the kids with natural math talent, who, though, those who are not utter prodigies, so like highly, highly unusual kids, but, but very good, don't end up catching up. And in fact, are outclassed by all these students from other countries. We have more and more students from other countries coming to colleges. The Russians, Czechs, Estonians, Koreans, Japanese, Singapore, et cetera, um, both in math and in science. So this is a really a concern because these kids have this calling, and yet they're not being prepared for that calling. Um, we also have to be concerned about long-term effects on our country. Um, we have this notion that we're going to educate our, our children for, uh, for, for STEM, and our, we're going to educate our future sciences, scientists and engineers, and yet we're using a curriculum that is undermining that. And we're also undermining our goal of, of mainstreaming our, and inc fully including uh, children on the autistic spectrum. So what can we do about this? Um, 
So when we, a lot of these kids, these STEM kids, are kids that are highly motivated in, their, in math and science. And actually, because they prefer working alone, they actually work quite well independently. So in a lot of cases, all you need to do is remove the barriers and give the kids some books and materials that they can work with on their own. Um, I mentioned Singapore math. That's sort of a popular curriculum used by homeschoolers. That, but it really, Singapore math is just like basically like the kind of traditional math still used in Europe and Russia and East Asia in general. It just happens to be in English. And it also has some really cool features like bar modeling. But the other option are books published before the 1960s, before new math. And if you get to before 1920, there's some 1923, there's some really cool early, early algebra books that, that um, and, and even elementary school books that, are, that have some really neat problems in them. And the thing about things that are published before 1923 is that they're in the public domain, so you can actually copy them for free. Um, also, allow these kids to work independently and get ahead um, and you know, use the IEP if the child has one to kind of bypass maybe some of what the school considers mandatory. Um, OK, and then what should be done in general um, as soon as possible is just to make challenging math available in all schools to those kids who can handle challenging math. Um, reinstate readiness-based grouping. Group kids with other kids that are ready for the same level of material that they are ready for. And then recruit and train teachers um, who have a strong content area in math so they are able to teach math at the appropriate level. I'm teaching Teach for America students right now. They're great. And that's one program that can attract um, some really good teachers. Um, I've been making a sort of a lot of kind of dark critical comments. And so I want to um, sort of conclude with one child who's really been helped by being allowed to get ahead and having the barriers removed. Um, this is um, a story from a mom who wrote me um, after I had a piece in the Philadelphia Inquirer on the reform math problem. And so I'll just, I'll just read it. I think I have time. Um, when my child entered school at age four years, he changed from an almost perfect child into a child just filled with anger and frustration that spilled over into his life at home. He gave Lord Voldemort a run for his money. We eventually spoke with the dean at the local community college, and they allowed him to register for a math class. We are now two weeks into the class, and a transformation has taken place in this child that can only be attributed to magic. Now he's apparently in the appropriate educational setting, even though he's only 11, and the four-year-old that we had the day before he started preschool, pre-kindergarten, pre has returned. He's happy, he's content, he's polite, he's empathetic, he can't wait to get to class. No more angry outbursts, no more fights with his brother, no more defiance, no more sulking, no more impulsive behavior, and no more begging him to do homework. He says he doesn't need his ADHD medication anymore, and he's right. We stopped it, expecting something awful to happen, but nothing did. He's with his intellectual peers, and most importantly, learning at the pace at which his brain works. The whole family is astonished at how it how changing his learning environment has changed his whole life. We are willing to sacrifice small animals to whatever God made this happen. He's happy. Is there anything better in life? So I found this very moving. Um, so in a nutshell, I sort of mentioned all these things. These are basically the things that I think um, we need to have happen. And uh, I want to say just a little bit about what I'm doing. And so I. Um, with Drexel have been part of the creation of a special concentration in um, autism education for special ed teachers who are interested in autism. So they get to spend, I created, designed two of the five courses that they take in becoming specialists in autism Asperger's syndrome. And I address some of the same issues I did in this talk in sort of preparing them for issues that are going to arise in school. The other thing I'm doing is I'm involved in a, um, a uh, what will hopefully ultimately be a charter school, French bilingual charter school um, for West African immigrants, um, French-speaking West African immigrants in West Philadelphia. Their parents have been quite alarmed by the math. They don't understand it. It doesn't make any sense to them. It's not like the French math. And, but what we're doing right now is we're starting an after-school program at, at a school that a lot of these children attend, a public school. And um, I'm going to be teaching Singapore math and also programming uh, to these kids. Um, and um, we're just about to get started, so that's very exciting. Um, anyway, so that's, uh, that's basically the situation. And um, uh, thank you for um, coming. <laughs>